Welcome to episode 292 of the DFO Rundown brought to you by Botano.ca. Uh, get in the game. And baby, there's lots of games this week. A huge playoff implication, some head-to-head matchups. Uh, the Penguins have a big need of a win tonight uh, in Toronto. Of course, Washington and Detroit battling head-to-head uh, tomorrow. So uh, lots of NHL games uh, to get to and more. Botano.ca, where the game starts. Now, I am Jason Greger. Welcome in, Frank. Sarah Valle and uh, Frank, there's a uh, lot to talk. Of course, we'll talk a uh, playoff race. We'll do a postmortem uh, on a few teams, but uh, I think we got to start with the, uh, the playoff race, which is five teams. We're down to the wire, four or five games remaining. The, the New York Islanders suddenly uh, sitting in the best position as uh, they currently hold down uh, third place in the Metro with 85 points. They got five games left. Then you have uh, Detroit with 84, Pittsburgh with 83, Washington with 83, the Flyers have 83, but they only have four games left. So it uh, looks like uh, you know, the Flyers probably have the uh, uh, the the lowest odds of getting in. And uh, they do have one game left head-to-head. They play Washington, uh, their final game of the season. We'll see what happens, though, man. It's It's been crazy. And from uh, you know a few weeks ago, I don't think anybody thought the Islanders or Penguins had a chance. But the other teams can't win. And suddenly, those two teams have a chance and might have the best chance. Here's the thing about pillow fights. If they drag on long enough, someone can just come in and knock you right out. One, catch you right on the jaw, and that's it. It's kind of what it feels like has happened to the Caps and Flyers. I mean, just look at... They didn't even need to pile up a ton of points. I think we were talking last week, and I said all these teams have to do is basically go 500 down the stretch. I mean, yep. the Caps are in the middle of 0, 4, and 2. And the Penguins are in the, or sorry, the Flyers are in the middle of 0, 5, and 2. And if you extend it back a little further for the Flyers, they are uh, 2, 2, 5, and 3 in their last 10. Yeah, it's actually worse than that. They're 2, 7, and 3. Hmm. It, it's... You didn't need a lot. You just needed to kind of milk, milk, squirt, squirt some points, and they just haven't been able to milk any. So there, um, there's there's a lot to unpack here. Let's say that. Yeah, like you know, and the Penguins, hey, they they took advantage of other teams losing. They've won four in a row, right? The Islanders have won four in a row, so they needed to do their part too. They needed a lot of help. hundred oh, percent. You know, so far, this they is- have. And- If this happens, this is going to go down as the biggest late season comeback in the salary cap era by the Pittsburgh Penguins. They they were nine points out 10 days ago. Yeah. They're they're now in a playoff position. And I don't, they're not in the driver's seat. The Islanders are in terms of percentages, but they've done pretty much everything you could ask to do to be neck and neck. We, we've said for, what, three weeks now, it's down to three teams for two spots? That is true. It's just that we got the teams wrong of which three are the teams. At least math-wise, it's the Islanders, Penguins, and Red Wings. And then below them are the Caps and Flyers. Yeah, the Flyers have a tough... Um... Now, the Islanders, they face the Rangers twice, the Devils the Canadians, and then their last game of the season. Like the schedule maker, man, give them credit. Got it right. Uh, Pittsburgh and the Islanders, uh, their final game of the season is head-to-head. Washington and Philly's final game of the season, head-to-head. And, you know, we'll see if it comes down to, to those games or not. But, um, you know, P- Detroit and Pittsburgh here play, I think, uh, later this week on on Thursday. So, you know, at least, uh, you know, you've got some head-to-heads against these teams, which makes it even more exciting. But, I look at the Penguins like if Jenny Malkin, I don't know if you watched the game against Tampa, Frank, if Jenny Malkin looked like Hart Trophy winning if Jenny Malkin, he has not had a great season, but suddenly that's kind of woken up here for the Penguins at the most crucial time of the year. I guess he just needed his parents to show up. Hey, why well, doesn't matter how old you are, buddy. Kids love it when mom and dad are there. Look, I mean, they usually plan their visit around the playoffs yeah. and that's why they come late in the season. This year, there might not be any. Or because of him, there might be, in yeah. part because of him. Um, here, here's look. Uh, because 
these playoff races and standings change on a nightly basis, I wanted to try and spin it in a more big picture thought. And so let me bounce a couple of these ideas off of you. The fact that the Penguins and Caps have gotten back in the race, what do these last two to three weeks say about the New Jersey Devils? Well, the, yeah, the Devils have had a disappointing season. There's no doubt. Um, and but this it, probably doesn't just it go beyond that. Yeah, it just like, reinforces it that they're not they're not as close as they thought. Like last year was was maybe a little bit of a uh, of a misleading season for for them. Like, although I, I would argue that it was disappointing. Now the Hughes and and uh, Hamilton injuries you can't uh, you can't overlook them. They're massive injuries for for a team. It's you know it's your best defense when you're best forward. Uh, Jack Hughes was playing unreal when he got hurt. Um, so that does play a factor in it, but I didn't have the devils at the start of the year because I felt their defense was too young and well, it got way younger when you took Hamilton out of the lineup. I didn't expect that. Uh, and we've talked about their issues, uh, construction wise relative to the other pieces they lost to the young pieces that they asked to, to do more, all of that. But to me, I mean, I think what it does more than anything is highlights their inaction. Like, what if they had addressed their goaltending situation earlier? Since yeah. arriving, Jake Allen has a 913. I'm not saying he's the savior. Since arriving, Capo Kakinen has a 918. What ha what if you the, had what if what's what their if you, record though? What if you had done it? 20 games earlier. What if you had made the coaching change 20 games earlier? No. Yeah. Well, I think they tried to make the goalie change earlier, right? But Calgary, uh, it fell apart at the last second, but still, yeah, you could have, you should have pivoted earlier. Maybe is what you're saying. Yeah. No, and, and look, to be fair, you asked what's the record since the trade deadline at six, seven and two. But my point is not, what is it since the, since the trade deadline? My point is the door has been wide open because the Pittsburgh Penguins walked through it. And if you would have had said before the season started that all of these teams in the East, the Flyers, the Caps, the Sabres, the Penguins, the Wings, all these teams are like, look, there's been a gap between all those teams and the Devils. Mm -hmm. I just think this is the fact that the, the Penguins have clawed back into this and um, and frankly, the Islanders, it's a, it's an indictment on how poor New Jersey's played start to finish. Well, I, you could, you could argue the same thing about the Sabres, right? They'd look and say, man, where would we have been? Cause all these other teams that are back in the race again, it's because it's not going to be a good team. Like you might need 90 points to get in. Right. No, well, um, it's, it, it, it's going to be less than that. I think. Right. Yeah, it might be. I mean, we're talking about a historically low bar to make the playoffs. The max that the eighth seed can get is uh, 94. That's the max. And it's, it's probably not going to get there. That's winning. That's winning out gets you to mm -hmm. 94. I mean, historically the bar is, is typically 94, 95. Um, my guess, as you said, you're probably right. It's going to be 90. It might even be 89. Mm -hmm. Um, it, to me, yeah, I, I, I know I'm beating a dead horse. I just, well, I'm, I'm trying to find the right words, the right thought process. And, and to take that a step further, let's say now you are the flyers. Let's. If you don't make the playoffs, what has this season been? And I, I'm I'm sure that that the answer that we're going to get is going to be, well, we are trying to build culture and competing. But to me, I, I think in a realistic, like take the like the buzzwords out of it. it if you fall just short of making the playoffs, to me, that's like the biggest fail you can have because all it does is reinforces that you're, you're stuck in the murky middle. Yeah. Is that and, too and, much? 
No, we'll because, see. It's a hard one because you can't ask players to lose on purpose, right? So no, I don't. And no one's asking that. But the point is, we got to the trade deadline, and they were saying, "Well, look, yeah, I know we're trading Sean Walker, and we're getting this first round pick, but the rest of the players that they could have traded, or frankly, the players that at this juncture in time they should have been having conversations about, were never really in the mix because it was like, well, we don't want to cut off our team's legs to to." their chances to make the playoffs. Now look where you're going to draft. I, I'm trying to think 10,000, 30,000 foot view, not right in the thick of things. And this is kind of what I was talking about from the beginning of the season to right now, you know, to, to the deadline to right now is it's all about perspective. Like the flyers are what they're going to be on track to draft 15th. Uh, 14th? Yeah, maybe. I mean, it's, yeah. it's in that range. Like what, like, what have you, what have you accomplished? It's not all about draft position. I get that it's more than that. And, and yeah, there were certainly some successful parts of this year, but, but I got to tell you just talking to some players like this, this losing streak, what, what does this, the Sean Couturier healthy scratch and John Tortorella calling his team soft and, I feel like there's a lot more to unpack than just this team started playing some of its worst hockey of the year at the most inopportune time. Yeah, I, I do think one thing about the draft is I, I think there there's lots of players, like obviously the top five usually you're going to hit on. Um, and I don't know if the Flyers were ever bad enough to be a bottom five team. So, um, but, you know, six to 15 to 20, if you look at it from year to year, um, you just make good picks and it almost doesn't matter where you're drafting in that regard. Like after the top five, it's, you know, you look like, look at the 17 draft, the uh, obviously there's Makar and, and, uh, and Heiskanen are great and, and Elias Pedersen, but then Jason Roberts, probably the next specs player, or you even look at Jake Ottinger and, you know, Dallas took both of them 29th and 39th. So look, I just think it comes down to, I, I get what you're saying, but don't, that's not the game we're playing here. It's not can the fly currently today they're they're slated to pick 12th. Yeah. I'm talking big picture. Of course, you can find players all over the draft board. It's a tale as old as time. That's not what I'm saying here. I'm saying what what course did the Flyers chart themselves on last summer? And then did they follow through this season to the best of their ability to execute that plan? Or did they get lost in trying to make the playoffs? I don't, so, I'm not saying that they did. I'm just saying it is a fair question to ask based on where they are right now. The fact that they are not going to have ping pong balls in the draft lottery thing, at least as of right now, they're not going to have ping pong balls in the draft lottery on May 7th or May 8th or whatever date it is. That to me is a fail if you also don't make the playoffs. Yeah, well, so if you look at the moves, like uh, connecting, I'm assuming, is the guy you thought they should have traded? I'm saying they didn't even, at least to my knowledge, and, and feel free for someone to correct me, they didn't engage in any real substantive conversation on a lot of stuff. Like, I know that you set a high price for Scott Lawton, but should you have moved him no matter what? See, I, I I say no, because I find teams, and unless you want to go full Chicago and just tear everything down, which takes a long, long time, and, and even then doesn't guarantee success, ask Columbus, um, that you get rid of Scott Lawton, and too many teams in rebuilds or retooling, all they do is they get rid, and he's a $3 million player. He's not a bad contract. He's got two more years. So you trade away a guy, what, for a draft pick and that, that might pan out? To me, I think a lot of times that's the mistake uh, that we see a lot of these teams make. And that's why you've got stuff, you know, you got teams that are crap for long, long periods because they're giving away proven NHL players for second round picks or third round picks. And I can tell you this, the percentage of those picks panning out is maybe 15 to uh, to 20%. That's if you hit it and that's if everything goes well and the player doesn't get injured and yada, yada, yada. So I actually think trading Scott Lawton who had 
two years left on his deal would have been a bad trade. He's not a bad cap hit at all. He's not, he's not hurting your team. He's keeping your team competitive. And if you want to bring in young players to your organization, if you're just getting the shit kicked out of you all the time, and we've seen it happen, that those players don't develop. They don't get any learning habits. It's all, we're going to put all the young guys in and the young guys are going to get, oh, everybody talks about opportunity. They need opportunity. Well, yeah, they get opportunity, but they don't learn how to play the right way and they're getting spanked every night. And we've, I've seen more of those teams than I've seen teams who, uh, who do it right. Like I'm still not so Chicago. Everybody can say, oh, look at their plan. Has their plan worked yet? No. And we'll see how long it takes to work. And they also got lucky with Connor Bedard. Yeah, but you you can't. Here's my point: you can't get Connor Bedard unless you put yourself in position to do so. Unless you give yourself an opportunity, the Flyers will not have at least if the draft lottery was today. They do not even have a one percent chance. There's a zero percent chance that they can get Macklin Celebrini. No, that's fair. But they got Meechkoff last year. I think he's a hell of a player. It might turn uh, out to be a lot better than people fine, think. Fine, but he's still not going to be here for a few years. At least uh, that's the schedule. My my point is, what was your plan? What were you realistic about what your team was? And then when you went out and overachieved this year and you had to ask yourself the toughest questions of all, how did you react? I'm not, again, I'm not saying the Flyers fumbled the bag. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying it's fair to ask the question of, did they get lost in, hey, we're in a playoff spot and we've been in one since late October. You know, this is we can be a playoff team this year. We should try and do that. And then I think it's fair to ask other questions. Should the Flyers have traded for Jamie Drysdale or should they have traded for Bowen Byram? Yeah. I mean, th there's a million things to, un and I'm again, we're not going to know the Drysdale answer for a few years. We don't but, know but what was, Byram's was, health is going to be would like. Would Colorado have traded Byram for, for Cutter Goche, who wasn't going to help him this year? I'm told that, yes, uh, that was on the table. Huh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, there's a million questions to ask. I'll, it's All I'm saying is, did you get lost in what you might have been instead of worrying about what you are? Yeah, and, and I think the same questions, like I said, the same questions existentially can be asked of the devils. Well, what hey, are you to, and where are you heading? Let's well, let's get to some teams then that are officially out. And uh, we've done the poll. We'll start. Uh, we'll go uh, west, east, west. So uh, let's start with the uh, the Flames and the Kraken. Frank, uh, you know the Kraken made the playoffs last year. They, yeah, you know, I didn't think I thought that was a, a perfect storm for them. I didn't expect them to make the playoffs this year. I almost think their off season showed that they felt like that they knew that last year was a perfect storm a little bit. Uh, you know, their fourth line, which was huge contributors, they all let them go in, in free agency, um, which, you know, we, we can debate if that was the right move or not. But what do you make of the Kraken season and, and how they shape up for next year? I think the Kraken are stuck right in the NHL's murky middle. They're obviously too deep to bottom out. And they, at least right now, clearly don't have the goods to be among the mix in the West. How do they change that? I mean, I think you need a massive jump from Matty Beneers, and he had, you know, that fantastic rookie season last year and has sort of. Is sophomore slump fair to call it? Is it? Oh yeah. What do you, what do you, I don't, I don't know how to explain what we've seen. He hasn't obviously been bad by any stretch. He just hasn't shown the same, like all the sort of intangibles are there, the intelligence and the defense and, and the complete game. But obviously the production has waned because when, the rest of the people around you aren't having career years like everyone did last year. Your numbers aren't going to be quite as good. The other thing about the Kraken that I look at is you always need the support from your, you know, from vets in order to be successful. But 
I'm looking at their cap page and their cap table and I'm going, man, some of these guys are kind of older. Like Tanev, 32. Yanni Gord, 32. Jaden Schwartz, 31. Jordan Eberle, 33. Andre Burakovsky, 29. Like this is not a young team. It's not a young core. And I think what they're trying to do is successfully layer in the younger players like the Beneers, who they asked to do a lot. But then next is going to be Jagger Furcus. And next is going to be, you know, go through the list of the guys that they are going to try and assimilate to their team. Um, they, they just have a lot of work to do. It, it's going to take time. And what is Shane Wright? I like the patience that they've shown with him and he's obviously had a good year in the American league, but a big step forward, but still not lighting the world on fire. And when you take him at four overall, like you, you got to get, I'm not, again, I'm not saying that he isn't because look at what we've seen recently of, um, of Alexi Lafreniere. And I know they weren't, they're not apples to apples because one is number one and one's number four, but I, I think, you know, it's the Lafreniere story and the fact that he, you know, could be closing in on 30 goals this year and a huge step forward is patience is necessary. And that's probably the, the tagline of the Seattle Kraken is patience is necessary. But they've got a lot of work to do to get from also ran to in the mix. And then there's an even bigger jump between in the mix and contender. And I guess the way I see it right now, I, I'm still like, they need that transformational piece. They need that star that's going to get them there. And unless I'm missing it, I don't know that they have it. Yeah. Well, you know, it's fair. To, to say that, I, I you know, Shane Wright, I think they're happy with his development. He obviously came up and scored two goals the other game. He's got three goals in six NHL games this season, which, you know, they'd be happy about him and Beneers. I think, you know, looking coming up, Jagger Furcus, the, the Furcus Circus in, the, in Moose Jaw this year is having an unreal 19-year-old season in the dub. He had 126 points. He had seven points in the first four games in the, in the in playoff round uh, in that sweep for the Warriors. I think they believe there's a skill guy. Now, I'm not saying he's NHL ready yet necessarily next year, but he'll probably get an opportunity, right? They, they got, uh, you know, they, they had so many first and second rounders last year that I think they're, if I look big picture, Frank, they're a team that's, okay, we're competing now. Uh, we've got all the veterans. And by the time those veterans move on here in the, in the next year or so, right? Because they still, you know, the problem is they probably have them for two more years, right? And you know, some of them, I, I think they'll probably ship out in, the, in that final season, right? Um, and then they have a lot of young guys coming in. They'll have to keep one or two of their guys. Like, I would keep Yanni Gord if if I was them, just because I like his competitiveness. I like how he plays. Uh -huh. I think a lot of the other guys are kind of similar type players. I think you can get rid of a few of them if you can. But Seattle is definitely um, a ways away. And especially right now where the West has so many really good teams. Like, I'd say it right now, you know, Seattle's destined to miss the playoffs again next year, because I just don't see which teams in the West are all going to come back that far that are going to be a big drop off where Seattle can compete with like the top teams in the West are all pretty good. Right. So then the next question is what's the path for Seattle to get there? Like, you, you know, obviously you try and give all the time in the world to, you mentioned Fergus and then Saleh and, and all these guys that, um, you know, could be on the radar, but, do you pursue free agents? Do you try and make a trade? Like at some point they're going to need a little extra juice to get going. And I don't, I just don't know what that path is yet. They need to make smart free agent moves of middle tier guys that you don't have to overpay for. Cause I don't think the top They've done a great are, job at that. Yeah. And that's what they need to continue doing because now for agency, and I'll say it all the time, like for agency is not the place to build a winner. Okay. It just historically it isn't. Right. Like you look at, you know, which players had the most points on a new team this year. It's it's hard to come to a new team and just light it up right away. Some guys do it year two or three. And that's unless happened. you're getting a Panarin and those yeah. guys rarely come up. And 100%. not only that, you have to convince them to come to Seattle, New York for a Russian. That's an easy sell. Yeah. Now, Seattle's a nice city, though. I will say that. Oh, I'm not saying it's not. I'm just saying 
it's not a storied original six franchise with a huge Russian community. Like it's yeah. just there. That's not checking the boxes for all these free agents that might pop up that, Hey, the next game changer, whoever that is that actually makes it to free agency. What will that look like? I do say the, the one move they might not want to do it, Frank, but the one player, if they looked at making a splash that could get them, you know, like multiple players, maybe in return would be Adam Larson in the summertime. He's got one year left at $4 million. He's a teams are dying for proven legit top four, right? Defenseman. And that's what he is. And he's got an unreal cap hit for a full season. Um, I just saying, if you want to get ahead of the curve rather than wait till the trade deadline, because I think at the trade deadline is a guarantee he'll get moved. That's a guy to look for in the off season that uh, come at the draft. You might be able to, to land quite a bit more than you would maybe at the deadline. I guess I, I understand what you're saying, but a, again, it just puts you further away from where you're trying to get to. Now, to get to where they want to get to, they need the next Adam Larson. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're right. It, it's it, it's like you're going to have to take two steps backwards to take more forward. I, I just – they're going to need to turn that tide. That's my only point. Yeah. No, that's fair. Well, it's interesting when you go from them. Now we'll go out east to a team that um, – wh when your season – the, the most talked about parts of your season are empty net goals. I think that illustrates that there's an issue. Like Ottawa, you know what? There was the, uh, the Toronto empty net goal earlier in the year, and then Riley gets the five-game suspension. And then there's he sure, and it's after the whist, after the buzzer sounds, and he and doesn't even do anything aggressively. And, you know, now I know, I don't even know how upset Kachuk is. I think he just, you know what? He's trying to do something there. But it, to me, it's somewhat comical that the highlight of the Ottawa season has has focused around two empty net goals. Well, one wasn't even a goal. One was putting the puck in an empty net after the whistle. I don't even know what the hell you call it. But either way, that, that illustrates how disappointing of a season it's been in Ottawa for me. I'm with you. I, I don't I don't even have the words, I don't think, to properly explain the Ottawa Senators, this is the most dis disappointing season of all 32, and I don't think it's close. I viewed this team as one that was ready to take a big step forward and compete. And I wasn't a hundred percent sold. They were going to be a playoff team, but man, I thought in the last week they'd be living and dying with games. That's how I viewed this season going for Ottawa. And look, there's a lot that went into this year. Like think about some of the off ice stuff, not to say that's I, I, please. I'm not providing any excuse because I think this ultimately comes down to the players. Um, but your team changes hands in a sale. A new president of hockey operations is installed. One of your top centers is suspended for the first 41 games of the season. Your coach gets fired. There's, there's a lot. Your GM gets fired, by the way. There's a lot to unpack um with this whole sends debacle and i'm left with a real interesting question which is to this point steve steo since taking over as president of hockey ops has shown um a lot of restraint i would say because look i know they didn't want to make the gm change when they did um the Pinto thing just kind of put it over the top and they were loath to make a coaching change that it almost felt like in some ways the writing was on the wall for both of these guys heading into the season. And I, I don't think that um, Michael and Lauer wanted to go into this year as the henchmen, but to me, they should have ripped the bandaid off this summer when everyone knew that, that's probably where the fate was trending for uh, for Pierre Dorian and for DJ Smith. I think what's more curious to me has been the mostly inaction since then. You can put me on record as saying that I, unless they have someone in mind that they just aren't able to get their hands on, meaning um, unless they want the coach of the Marlies uh, and his name escapes me at at the at the second. Um, unless they want the coach of the Marlies that Michael Anlauer and Steve Steos previously worked with, 
than John Gruden is his name. Mm -hmm. Unless that's their guy, then what, what, why haven't you made a permanent coaching change? This season has been lost. And, and what I'll point to is the Vancouver Canucks. They bring in Rick Tockett last year and the last chunk of their season to me, the best part of that is that he gets to know the players. They get to know him. And then when they arrive for day one of training camp, they know exactly what to expect and what it's going to be like. It's not a feeling out process. There are no questions. And so if it isn't Gruden or someone else that just isn't available right now, what there's so many qualified great head coaching candidates. Why have Jacques Martin go through this long of a period of time? Jay, Jay Woodcroft, Todd McClellan, uh, Lindy Ruff, Craig Berube. Like, I don't think the coaching pool, and again, unless it's John Gruden, I don't think the coaching pool is really changing between now and then. Do you think that based on round one results, someone's getting gonged this year? It would be very hard when you think of it. like there's there, there's so many guys that have already been tra that have moved out. So I, I don't know if I see a big list of, of teams that are going to switch uh, coaches. Now there's there's the interim tags, right? Those might be a question, right? St. Louis and stuff like that. But I just view as that as further competition. Teams, yeah, like as far as playoff bound teams, like I don't know. Um, like you go through the the teams in in the West, and which which one of them, if they lose in the first round, would would fire their coach? Like I don't. You know, L.A. just got one. Edmonton just got one. Um, Dallas, no. Colorado, like Jared Bender, all he's done is win. So I don't, I don't see how he's going anywhere. Vancouver, not with Tockett, no chance. Right? Um, Winnipeg, bonus. I'd be stunned. So he might yeah, step I, I, away. Obviously, he missed a lot of time due to health yeah, reasons. But like, sure. again, these are potential competition spots for hiring your next guy. Yeah. St. Louis, LA, like all these places potentially are looking for coaches. What they must, they must have something in mind. I can't imagine why else you would sit here and be, be complacent. Well, and the other thing that they need to do, Frank, I, I said at the start of the season, I, I've been wrong on some teams on who I thought, but Ottawa is exactly who I thought they'd be. They don't, they don't defend well enough. Now I know they've given up a lot of goals and people want to say it's just goaltending. Goaltending hasn't been good enough, but when you look at the difference from Cam Talbot to Corpus Allo, and they switch teams essentially, you look at their numbers in LA, very strong defensive team, and then you look at their numbers in Ottawa, you can't sit there and, and be oblivious to the fact that regardless of who plays in Ottawa, they have way worse numbers, right? Their team defense is not good enough. It's a fact. It's not good enough. So they need to improve it, and I don't, I don't know if you can just say it's a coach. Jacques Martin was supposed to be this, you know, he's defensive-minded coach. He was going to come in and help these guys learn defense. Well, what's their defensive numbers being under Jacques Martin? Hardly any better than they've been under DJ Smith. So clearly the mix of players that you have isn't working. So that to me is going to be the off-season question mark in, in Ottawa. I think they've got to make a significant move. I don't think they can just roll it back, think, okay, we got a new coach and that that's going to change our lot in life, and we're going to be a much better team. Like I, I think that'd be delusional. The players play the game. They impact 90%. Coach can come in and, and add some elements to a team, no question. But ultimately, every coach I've talked to, you're only as good as your players, right, at the end of the day. You can take an A-minus team and maybe make it an A team, but you're not taking a, a C-level defensive team and thinking one coach is suddenly going to have them as an A-minus or a B-plus defensive team. I, I think that's kind of delusional. I'm with you. And I, uh, again, today's existential question day. What is the potential? What is the future of Josh Norris and that shoulder? Yeah. Is there a country club atmosphere? And th this is from the previous regime. But when you have five players making $8 million or more for the foreseeable future that are all, with the exception of Shabbat, pretty young guys in this league does that create a country club atmosphere and environment? Hey, I I've got my money. It doesn't really matter what happens next. I don't, I think that might be a cheap question to ask. Meaning I don't look at Brady Kachuk and say that he's ever not competing or not working or not showing up, but 
I think they've they've got so much to figure out there. Who's going to be part of this core moving forward? And maybe Steve Steos has the answers. And I agree with probably his premise that the trade deadline isn't the time to ask those big questions, that it's the offseason when there's more teams involved. I think watching this all play out, if you're a Sens fan, what you're starving for is, is action. And not action for the sake of action, but... I think you're spot on. If we go into next season and this team looks pretty similar to what it is now, I don't know how you could possibly expect different results. Well, I would look at the makeup of their team and I say, okay, who is their, who's their 20, you know, guys who've been in the league five, six, seven years, um, who are, you know, 27, 28, 29, who are solid defensive aware forwards. Right. Because if you look, you got Stutzel and Kachuk and Batherson, you know, Ridley Gregg, you know, I like Shane Pinto. I like all their players. They're all young. They're good. But who is their key guys that you can say, okay, this guy I trust to play defense for us? Claude Giroux can win you a key face off. There's no question about it. But Claude Giroux was always maybe known more as, a, as an elite offensive player as he was an elite defensive player. He's not bad defensively, but he's also 36. He, he's like, not had a good year defensively. Yeah. Like, you know, Dominic Kubelik is not that guy. 28 years of age. Like they, you know, uh, Zach McEwen, it's not really that guy. They don't have anybody in that age range, Frank, when I look at the makeup of their team, because I do believe that sometimes you need veteran guys who can be in the room and, and, and be like, Hey, because the coach can show you in video all you want, but being held accountable to your teammates and sometimes being shown it. And then having a coach who's like, I know I can put this line on the ice in the final minute of a period, or we've got some, some long-standing penalty killer guys. I think that's what, and Steve Stales was that player, right? Steve Stales was never a superstar on your team, but he was a really good, you know, second pair defenseman for a long time, blood and guts type of player. So I think Steve, I'd be curious, Frank, if we find Steve Stales to go out there and find some third line guys who can check, who can defend, and then some defenders who played the game like he does. That I, I'd be stunned if we don't see a direction from him this off season that really, you know, lines up with that. They have enough offensive players. I don't think they need more. Maybe, you know, maybe you move one, but if you move one, you've got to bring in some of that veteran presence who's been in the league long enough, who knows how to defend. And I don't think they have those guys offensively or defensively. You already, I don't know. You must have not heard his press conference or heard it and maybe just filed it away. The phrase Steve Steos used is we need more 200 foot players. That's it. That he said it point blank. That's what he's targeting is players who play at both ends. They need more of that. You're right. And the other big question they're going to have to ask themselves is this Jacob Chikorin situation has to come to a head. We cannot, as the Ottawa Senators, pay Sanderson, Shabbat, and Chikorin $24 million to play on the, the left side of our defense. They need right shot guys. Chikrin is going to need a raise. So it's either you give him the extension or you trade him. And no sense heading into next season with that log jam on your left side. I've said all along, I think they'd much rather move Thomas Shabbat. I just don't think they have the interest or ability to move him at $8 million a year for the next four years. It's certainly not near as, as much as the interest is there for, for Chikrin. Yeah, that makes sense. So that's definitely a move uh, they need to make. And then lastly, let's go uh, back out west. Uh, the Calgary Flames, Frank. Uh, you know, inter we obviously they, they moved a lot of guys. Uh, you know, Hannafin and Lindholm, and you know we'll, we'll see and you know how the picks pan out and stuff in the future. But you know, where do the Five Flames guys. go? From? Like, where do the Flames go from here? They go into maintenance mode. And that's not to say they sit back. Um, they've got their picks now that they're going to draft and then nurture and develop. That's going to take a few years. They've got some prospects in those deals that they're believers in. And a heavy Russian influence, by the way, on it feels like a lot of those uh, guys that they're bringing in. And in the meantime, 
we just talked about Seattle and potentially mid tier free agents. That's what Calgary is going to be looking at. Uh, Craig Conroy had said it. Um, he mentioned it to me at the GM meetings that he's going to be active for free agents. He's got some cap space and he said it's, it's a huge part of it's going to be term, you know, two, three, four years, four years at the absolute max. And obviously he's not spending a ton. Like he's not big game hunting, but he's going to try and add some guys that he, he feels like, um, can, help support this team in the meantime. And then obviously the ne the next big question is what do you do on the goalie front with Jacob Markstrom relative to uh, Dustin Wolf? Well, and, but the other interesting kind of quiet thing, Frank, last summer they had all these guys who were, who were going to be pending UFAs at the end of the season. Right. And then I like, and they didn't move any of them in the summer. They ended up moving a few during the season. Well, going into this summer, Mangiapani, Kuzmenko, and Sharon Govich, much younger, they're all pending UFAs next summer. So, you know, I wonder about extension, like Sharon Govich, I think they really want to resign, just scored his 30th goal. That trade has really worked out for them. But, you know, I, I wonder what direction they go with Mangiapani and Kuzmenko. And, you know, maybe those are guys they just keep and, and move closer to the deadline. You know, they're, they're not on the same level of a guy like uh, Lindholm or Hannafin or Backland, who they re-signed, right? So I understand that. But, yeah, but why would you trade those guys while their value is low right now? Well, Sharon, Sharon Govich, you don't want to trade. I think No, no, no. I'm trade. saying I'm talking specifically Kuzmenko and Manjapani. Yeah. You, you, you hope that next year they can rehab their game a bit or their numbers improve and you can flip them. Or maybe Kuzmenko plays himself into a longer role with your team. I doubt Manjapani does. I, I'd say that you could start the 11 month countdown on the end of his tenure there. Mm -hmm. But I think they're open minded when it comes to Kuzmenko. They they pushed hard to get him from Van, even though the Canucks had to make cap choices. They they are uh, they're believers in the upside of Kuzmenko based on the 39 goal 74 point season that he had last year in Van. Yeah, I'm, I'm really curious to see what they're going to do. on the, I think the free agent's going to come more on the back end. They've got 13 forwards signed already. So, um, you know, they'll, they'll look. And then what do they do with Oliver Shillington, right? Like, I, I think they might want to re-sign him. He's come back. He's like, he was really good before he left. Oh. He's come back and he's he started to play better. So um, He's only going to get better, I think. Yes. Knocking some of those cobwebs off from not playing for almost two calendar years, 20 some months, 20 months. Um, yeah, I'd say obviously it's going to be up to Shillington because of, you know, he is a pending unrestricted free agent, but <clears throat> there's probably a comfortability factor. And I think the flames handled his situation so well that I'd be surprised if he decides to go somewhere else. Maybe he just wants a clean start or a fresh start somewhere else. And I guess that's possible, but I'm taking a step back and trying to put myself in his shoes. This team paid me for an entire season when I didn't play and they gave me all the space I needed and all the tools I needed to try and get better. Do I owe them another crack, another, another year to, to play? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Or you never know. Sometimes maybe you just look and say, hey, for whatever the issues were, Calgary, maybe there's a reminder of it. So I want a fresh start somewhere else. I, we don't know exactly what's going on there. So we'll see. But also the, the loyalty factor of knowing, hey, this is where I feel comfortable and they, they feel comfortable with me. That'll play a factor. But yeah, the Markstrom storyline, Frank, like obviously they were super close. We talked about it. I, I can't recall the time a player agreed to waive his no movement clause and then he didn't get moved. So, uh, you know, common sense would tell me there's a good chance Markstrom's going to get moved this offseason. I, I'm, I, I mean, yes, I'm with you. I'm not, I'm not ready to say like foregone conclusion that he's gone because yeah, they no. really want, they've, they know his value and they're not, they're not going to take a deal just to move him. No. And in theory, Frank, it might make more sense to have Markstrom with Wolf. If we're being honest, that's like a hundred percent. That's, I think that's a, the Wolf mental, isn't a lock. yeah. And then that's the thing though. What does that split look like? Markstrom is a competitive guy. 
is he willing to take less of a role, so to speak, knowing that Wolf is going to need more games over each of the next two years? Yeah. There's a lot of, there's a big conversation to have between Craig Conroy and Jacob Markstrom. Let's bring in uh, Tyler Uremchuk to the show. What is up, gentlemen? I'm back with another edition of Buy or Sell, delivered by DoorDash. 25% off zero delivery fees on your first order of $15 or more. All you need to do is download the DoorDash app and enter the promo code NATION25. You can take advantage of the new Double Dash feature, which allows you to add a second stop onto your order for zero extra delivery fees. Uh, you guys talked a little bit about the playoff picture out in the East. So I'll take an easy one here to start and talk about something, some of the seeding races around the NHL, the Toronto Maple Leafs, five back of the Florida Panthers with two games in hand, the Winnipeg Jets, two points back of the Colorado Avalanche with a game in hand. Both those teams also uh, hold the tie, or sorry, Toronto doesn't hold the try at tiebreaker, Winnipeg does. And then the other seeding race is Edmonton sitting three back of Vancouver, game in hand, one head-to-head matchup to go. Frank, are you buying on any of those three teams finishing the job and catching the team above them for the end of the season? No. None of them. Oh, Selling for three. on all three. Oh, Frank. You don't believe in anyone? Mm, it's not that I don't believe. I just... It also becomes a math game. Like, it doesn't really take a lot from Colorado to, to hold off Winnipeg. It doesn't really take a lot from Florida to hold off Toronto. And games in hand are great, but you still got to win them. Like the assumption is even if you win those games, you're still point, you're still a point or two or whatever it is back, depending on the race. I think if anything, um, the, by far the most fascinating is how does basically six, seven and eight work out in the West? which matchup does Edmonton get and then who finishes seven or eight? Is it Nashville or is it LA or Vegas? Yeah. There still is an outside chance that there's no crossover team and, and Vegas there. I mean, they're two points back of Nashville with two games in hand, LA still one point back of Nashville with one game in hand. So however that ends up working out, will be interesting. Greg's Edmonton catching Vancouver, Winnipeg catching Colorado or the Leafs catching the Panthers. You buying on any of those? Well, I think the Leafs are too far back. Um, you now, ask me this question tomorrow; will be a lot easier. Like, if Vancouver loses to Vegas tonight, then uh, then I think it opens a door for Edmonton. They obviously have a head to head. Um, the Colorado Winnipeg one. When you look, Winnipeg owns the tiebreaker because they have more regulation wins. So if they win their game in hand, they're tied with four games to go. Uh, in the four games, though, Colorado they play Minnesota tomorrow, but then they have three days off. Then they play back to back Winnipeg Vegas, which is not an easy back to back. And then they have three days off again before they play Edmonton. So they have a pretty good schedule as far as rest goes uh, for them. They, they look a little fatigued here. They got spanked by Edmonton and Dallas. It was, you know, third game in four nights in Dallas, second of a back-to-back. So maybe that's an excuse. Maybe it's real. Uh, I don't know. Uh, they obviously missed uh, Rantanen uh, in, in the second half of the Edmonton game and obviously the game in Dallas. But, like, the abs are just giving up too much right now. So I think if there's one team that's susceptible of the three, I think it might be Colorado because Winnipeg owns a tiebreaker. Edmonton has to catch Vancouver and be actually points ahead of them because of tiebreaker. So we can argue that they're kind of um, they're four points back, not three, because they have to finish ahead of Vancouver. So I think that's hard. But if Vancouver manages to lose to Vegas tonight, and uh, you know who knows what Vegas is doing in their goaltending situation, you know that's the question. But Vancouver has really, you know what they've come, they've really kind of slogged down the stretch here, right? And they can't beat L.A. I think if you're the Vancouver Canucks, you want to hope that you don't play the the Kings in round one because they don't have an answer to the Kings style. The Kings have absolutely smothered them in games this year, and they look frustrated. So um, if you're Vancouver, you uh, you don't know if you're going to play Vegas or L.A. That's the thing. But um, I I still think Colorado's maybe the one right now because they're banged up. and, uh, And Winnipeg, they got a little bit of an easier schedule. Yeah, it'll be interesting. The Jets, they uh, they get the Avs on Saturday. So Saturday has Winnipeg, Colorado, and Edmonton, Vancouver on tap. Uh, next one I got for you guys. You spent a little bit of time talking about the Ottawa Senators earlier on the podcast. I had this one written down before I knew you were talking about the Senators, but I'm going to say the Senators trade a piece of their core, one of those players that's locked up long-term. Buy or sell, Griggs? 
Hmm. I'm probably, I will probably sell. I think it's more likely it's Chikrin. Um, Norris, you probably can't trade him. I'd, I'd be surprised if you're trading Kachuk. Shabbat right now, probably hard to move him. So, I, and they're not trading Stutzla. So I, I'll say, and Batherson, he's a pretty good deal at 4.9 million. Yeah. So I don't know why, why you'd want to trade him. That'd make no sense. So I'm going to sell. And uh, I think it's probably more, much more likely it's Chikrin. Yeah, I'm going to sell as well. I, I'm with Jay's theory. I guess the wild card would be, does anyone from that group raise their hand and just say, uncle, I've had enough. This team is not trending in the direction that I want it to, and I want to play somewhere else. Hard to do when you've got that contract, but because you committed to it, you knew at the time when you signed it that it might not be uh, a quick ascent. But I think you always have to allow for that possibility. I will say the one guy that I don't think Thomas Shabbat, you put him with, with a defense partner. That's a real, I still think Shabbat can, can help your team. I, I think right now he, he was, he was given so much early on in his career. Like you go back and you look at the minutes he played and who he played with and all these, like you're, you're setting a guy up for failure. I still think Thomas Shabbat, you give him a new address. I think he, I think he might be the player that a lot of people thought he'd be. But yeah. they need a Mark Mathot to play with Eric Carlson. That's what they need. Uh, that I think actually he's obviously not nearly as good. I think lack of defensive game. He plays a similar game to Carlson. Fair. All right. Last one. You guys talked about this team last week, but I got a buy or sell question on them. It's the Montreal Canadians. They got some picks. They got a little bit of cap space to maybe use. I'm going to say the Canadians go out. I don't know if it's free agency, maybe in the trade market, but they make a big splash this summer and add to their group. Buy or sell, Frank. I'll buy only because that's actually been in Kent Hughes' playbook the last two years. Two years ago at the draft, they trade for Kirby Doc. Last year at the draft, they trade for Alex Newhook. Both of those guys aren't really on anyone's radar because Doc played four periods this season. Yeah. And Newhook has already set career highs and he's only played 48 games. So he missed 27 games with a high ankle sprain. They've found a way to leverage players that are coming off of entry level deals or uh, are still very young at 21, 22, 23 years old and have found ways to pry them loose by giving up a first round pick. I think that's a really smart way to try and build your team um, because, again, it's not just that the pick takes longer, there's no guarantee that they're anywhere near the level of an NHL player that those two guys are or could be. And I actually talked a lot about this with Kent Hughes in a frankly speaking podcast that drops on Tuesday. So stay tuned for that, but um, I will buy. I think they got to address their defense and I think um, you're right. They got a lot of picks. They've, they've got a fair amount of young players too. So I could see a splash for a defenseman. I think they really have got to augment their their blue line and and get some other you know veteran guys who can just be good, sound I, defensive players. Like that's what they need. I couldn't agree with you less. Oh, I they have an absolute logjam on defense coming of really really good players that they're going to need to trade away pieces on defense because they have too many. But then they're just going to be rolling with all kids, who? aren't they? Who? David Reinbacher, Lo Logan Mayu. Look at some of the young guys. Uh, let me just pull Lane up their Hudson. sheet. Lane Hudson is 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 going to sign. Like they they have ten defensemen right now that they need to cut down. That yeah, are all raised. they're all twenty two or younger. They have. I'm telling you, in short order, they're going to have an embarrassment of riches that they're going to have to figure out. It's going to be harder to do. I I know what you're saying. Make a splash. Get get someone that can help augment. I think they've got the other problem right now. The Canadians are Canadians gave up the seventh most goals in the NHL this year. Do that's they think not, they're going to get younger on defense and win? That's the most ludicrous plan ever. Get that out of here. <laughs> Come on. They they lead goals left and right. Oh, you know what? We got all these young guys that are look good in the American League. Yeah, that's what losing teams continually sell themselves for. 
That would be a terrible plan. If they don't get some good defensemen to help augment their young guys, they're just going to get murdered again next year. It's not about next year. It's about probably about two years from now. I'll make you, I'll make you a bet. I'll make you a bet that two years from now in 2026, when we're on episode 450 or 500 or 600, whatever it is of the DFO rundown by then, that the Montreal Canadiens will not only make the playoffs, but will feed you with that, that claim that they look at their defense and how young it is. You're, you're going to be, you're going to be shocked how good their defense is. All right. What do you want to bet? Do you want to bet? You're like, you got a real betting problem. You want to bet for two years in advance. So you're telling me that they're not going to add any veteran defense in that time. And they're only going to bring up young guys. I no, I, I didn't say that they're not going to add any veteran defense, but they've got Matheson and they've got um, Savard right now. And they don't really need any more than that. Wow. I disagree with that. Okay. That's what <laughs> makes like this fun. Because if we agreed, why would anyone listen for 57 minutes? Yeah. I love when I push the right buttons with these questions as well. That is a wrap on a new edition of Buy or Sell delivered by DoorDash. It's fun. Hey, it's hard. I get the uh, the balance of having young guys and stuff, but history outlines teams don't win with too much youth. They just don't. So uh, let's get it uh, wrapped up here. Uh, the uh, pod, of course, is always brought to you by Wendy's uh, Daily Survivor. Go to uh, dailyfaceoff.com if you uh, want to play. It's a new week, so you're telling me there's a chance. And the only thing sweeter than victory this week is starting your day with the new Cinnabon Pull Apart from Wendy's. It is so damn good. Uh, so, hey, you can win and you can get the Cinnabon Pull Apart with Daily Face Off. They're giving you a chance for both. Sign up today by Wendy's and the Wendy's app. Go to dailyfaceoff.com. In the top right corner, you'll see the Wendy's sign. It's impossible to miss. And uh, good luck. Uh, it's down to the final few weeks. Somebody's going to win five grand. But it won't be Frank and it won't be myself. So, No chance. No, I'm like the, I'm the Montreal Canadiens of picking in this one defensively. That's what I'll say right now. Just to tie it into the Jeez, pod. Doubling down. Mm-hmm. Frankie, have yourself a great week. We will uh, chat with you. We'll see if the playoff picture is any clearer later this week.